How many of you remember where you were on the bicentennial celebration of America? Remember 1976, July 4th, 1976? Some of you have a hard time remembering what happened last week, let alone back in 1976. And some of you weren't even born then. And I was, I was one of those who was born and uh, had been alive and starting to come of a little bit of awareness and a little bit of age to where I kind of remember what was going on. And I remember uh, starting school and, and I remember going to kindergarten and I remember um, seeing this, this bicentennial celebration that was, that was upcoming. And, and I knew we also in 76 were going to have an election and uh, there was a whole lot of, of unrest and unease in America, it seemed like, uh, in my little brain of, of a young child in that, that time frame. I remember a little bit about uh, Vietnam and, and uh, troops coming home, and I remember Watergate and a lot of unrest that way. And, and so coming up to the, the bicentennial celebration, and, and for us as a nation to celebrate and to rejoice and, and to remember back what God had done for us and what we had, had uh, come together to, to create this nation. Um, I remember, for me, I think I was in Archie, Missouri, because my aunt and uncle were, were school teachers in that area. And <clears throat> so I'd gone there with my family to to be a part, and they, they had all kinds of activities and festivities going on on the, the 4th of July. And, and I remember that my uncle, I believe, he was kind of ornery, and, and he entered my dad in a contest, a mustache contest, and my dad wasn't even aware of it, but, but uh, he actually won the contest. And so <laughs> there I am to the right of my dad and my, my little brother to the left, and my dad with his ribbon of his uh, mustache there that he won. I'm, I'm hoping my parents are going to be able to join us uh, sometime in October is what we're looking forward to, trying to get them to come to Florida. So I'm looking forward to having them come here, and then you can see them firsthand and not in some of these photos that I show up from time to time. But, but the bicentennial celebration was a chance for, for our nation to kind of to uh, regroup a little bit and, and, to, and to look at some positive things in our world. Um, but it was clear to me as a young child that, that uh, there was really no debate or discussion that America was the good guys. We wore the white hats and, and uh, everyone else wore the black hats. You know, they were, they were the bad guys. And, and you know, we, we look at the bad guys in Vietnam and China and North Korea and the Soviet Union. And so it was pretty clear to me that, that those lines of distinction were drawn. And, and I thought, you know, with America and our past and our history of helping and serving and being such a, such a good neighbor that I thought everybody would love um, Americans. You know, how we, we went over to Europe and World War I helped the Europeans, um, you know, fend off the Germans. And then, then it, I, World War II came and, and again, we liberated Europe and at the cost of, you know, many lives, many servicemen gave their lives, and, and not just Europe, but also uh, the Pacific as well. And so I thought, you know, clearly we're going to be well-loved by, by everybody. And then um, you see what goes on around the world in, in the history books, and you see how some of these ruthless nations operated. And I, I remember seeing reports from um, Cambodia and the killing fields that were going on there. I remember reading um, in class about some of the atrocities that were going on in the Soviet Union, um, the political opposition that uh, were, was dealt with by imprisonment or death, uh, send them off to uh, Siberia to prison camps, um, the Nazis, the millions that they put to death, uh, Jews, Christians, anybody. Uh, so it was clear to me that America were, was the good guys. And we were the richest country, the most innovative country, the most powerful nation, the most charitable nation. We were largely responsible for the missionary movement around the world. Um, we were the ones who, who uh, encouraged religious freedom and liberty. And so when I traveled to England when I was in college, I carried all the assumptions that, that as an American that I would be well received everywhere I went because everybody would just naturally love an American. But I found out that really wasn't the case. And I remember talking to some folks in England, I, 
And, uh, you know, I probably said it kind of like this. I said, you know, we bailed you out of World War I and World War II. How come you're not grateful? And for some reason, they didn't see it with the same perspective that, that I had. Um, it, was, it was interesting how, how your perspective is different um, depending on where you were raised and, and from what country you're from. Well, the rest of the world has maybe a little different perspective than, than those clear lines of delineation of good and bad and, and evil and, and the good guys that I had. Um, but, but God has some clear lines, doesn't he? He knows very well the righteous from the unrighteous. He knows the wicked and evil from, from the godly. Proverbs 14 34 says, Godliness makes a nation great, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So, so how do we know... How do we know what is sin? How do we know what is evil? Um, and some of you might be thinking, well, come on, preacher. Are you really that thick? Are you really that dumb? I mean, I know you're from Kansas. Are you some kind of an idiot hayseed that you don't know right from wrong and good from evil? Um, but, but is there not a standard that we can all go to and turn to and look to? Um, what, what is our standard? Do we, do we look at, at the popular opinion of people? And so, you know, if we all take a vote, then we can decide this is good or this is evil. Uh, is, that, is that how we determine? Do we, do we look to our leaders only? We see a lot of corruption in, in different leaders that we've had, right? Um, politicians that, that change their mind from as the wind blows, you know. Okay, I'm for it. No, I'm against it. You know, I'm for it. You know, whatever the, wherever the winds shift and change and turn, that's where they fall out. Um, do, we, do we look to the Supreme Court? Do we look to those nine justices? Do they, are they the ones, the arbitrator of, of what is good and what is bad, what is sin and, and what, is, what is godliness? You know, I think most of us probably would agree with the writer of Proverbs that we've got to look to something outside of us. And we look to God, the ultimate king, to determine what is right and what is wrong, what is sin, what is, what is righteousness. And God has revealed his will to us through Jesus and, and through his word that, that points to Jesus. And, and I think this is one way that America has been set apart. This is one way that, that we can celebrate. You know, on this July 4th, we can celebrate Uh, the blessings of America and the birth of America. Our founding fathers made an attempt to craft a constitution, a governing document that that followed the biblical principles. Our founding fathers believed that they were making a covenant with the living God. And so as a result of that, they they put into place um, certain liberties and freedoms that, that we call the, the Bill of Rights. And, and there we have individual freedoms and, and also responsibilities. We have limitations on, on our leader. The king is not the law unto himself, but the king answers to a higher law, which is, which is God. And they put all kinds of limitations to try to, try to keep the government and the, and the leaders who are in power in check. And checks and balances, and they, they tried to pull these principles from the scriptures. And I think this is what, what sets America apart. Because we had a desire to, to go into a covenant with, with God and to and to have a nation that would be founded upon the principles of God. Um, but we, we know that we've got to be very careful because we've seen the corrupting you know, effects of power. Uh, Lord Acton said power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And, and certainly as Christians, we recognize that within each one of us, there's a natural bent towards sinning because of the fall, because of the uh, curse that came upon all humanity. We are born with this natural desire to, to rebel against God and, and to go our own way and to sin. And so John Adams, one of the founding fathers, in, in working on our government and forming the Constitution, he said, our, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any others. So he recognized that, that if this is going to work, it's going to have to have people 
who submit themselves under God. And, and there's no other way that this is going to work. James Madison wrote that our Constitution requires su- sufficient virtue among men for self-government. Otherwise, nothing less than the chains of despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Our founding fathers were men of faith and who were influenced by the Christian tradition. And, and as a result... Um, because of their experiences, because of their witness of what goes on around the world, um, they were very careful to limit the powers of this government because they know into the wrong hands it can easily be abused. And so they created for us an environment where freedom and liberty could, could flourish, where, where religious freedom would be available so we could seek after God. And where we could speak and not be in fear. Uh, We could worship and not be afraid um, that that we were in some way violating a leader. Um, Liberty and freedom is foundation. It's part of our DNA as Americans. And, And I think the result has been our nation has accomplished many incredible things. Um, incredible advances in technology. We've, we've created a wealth for a middle class that, that nobody else has seen before. The standard of living that we have, it, does, it, it, it outshines all the other nations. Um, the religious freedom, not just here in America, but how we've worked to try to bring that religious freedom to other parts of the world. We see this missionary movement that, that largely has been funded out of churches here in the United States. Um, The list goes on and on. Some of the charitable work that we do, and and when when tragedies happen around the world, Americans seem to respond. Now, I'm proud to be an American, and and I'm I'm grateful that I'm a citizen of the United States. Even though America's not perfect, I'm still grateful, and I'm, I'm proud that I have been blessed to be born into this, this nation. Um, but this covenant relationship was a, a relationship that put us under God. God who is the king. God who is the one who is in control. So what does that mean to live under God, to be in covenant with him? Um, I think we need to remember that God can use nations as, a, as his vehicle any way he seems to choose or fit. I don't know if you remember the story in Joshua chapter 5 where, where uh, God had delivered the people of Israel, his, his covenant people. The Israelites were in slavery for about 400 years in Egypt, and God powerfully and miraculously delivered them out of the hands of the most powerful nation in the world at that time, Egypt. And, and God did so, and it was clear that it was because of his hand that, that they were delivered, Right? And God was making good on the promise that he'd given to Abraham years before, that they would be able to have the the promised land, the inheritance there, the promised land. And so as the people came, they they grumbled against God and they rebelled against God. And and finally, God said, after many times, God said, enough, I've had it with you people. And he said, you will not enter the promised land now as a result. And so they waited 40 years out into the wilderness before all of those people who rebelled against God had died off. And then God said, okay, Joshua, you can can lead the people into the promised land now. And so in in Joshua chapter 5, Joshua's gathering the people together, and he's he's off. He's he's sort of doing a a scout ahead to to check out the situation. And we come across these verses in, in verses 13 and 14. When Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? And the man said, neither. But as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell at his feet and worshipped him because this was a probably a Christophany an appearance of the pre-incarnate Jesus, the commander of the Lord's army, 
who appeared before Joshua. And Joshua, who was leading God's people, God's covenant people, he asked a question that seemed, you know, pretty reasonable, right? Are you for us or for our enemies? And, and God says, Jesus says, I'm neither one. Um, you see, God is not for America or against America. God is building his church and his kingdom. And we've been instructed to join him in his work. We've been instructed to seek first the kingdom of God. And that means Jesus inviting us to join him, inviting our families to join him, inviting our nation to join him. And I know that Jesus is not happy with America that tries to be secular and neutral and and maintain some kind of uh, social order without him tries to exist not under God, but but as its own independent nation. God's not happy with that. And it's easy, though, sometimes for us to look over the balcony of history and we can wag our finger at all the people who've gone before us. And we can say, I can't believe that sin, and what outrageous, what a a stupid fool for, for sinning in this way and that way. And it's easy for us to cast judgment on people who've gone before us without understanding completely their situation and understanding the position that they were in, we can sometimes pass some foolish judgment upon the past. And I think we need to be reminded that one day we're going to stand before God and we're going to give an account of our life. And what did we do with the opportunities that were given to us? And did did we take advantage of every opportunity that came before us? to be, a, be an instrument in the hand of God. I think it's easy for us to, to criticize our nation, and yet at the same time, I think we can remain patriotic. We can criticize our nation if we do so with love, just like we can speak words of criticism to family members if we do so with love. The goal, the desire is to build them up, to make them better, to make them more like Jesus. And I have no desire to pile on a bunch of criticism of America today. I'm not interested in trying to tear America down. There's too many critics, I think, in our world today that want to destroy America. And that's not me. I love our nation. And I do feel blessed to have been born here. And yet I do know that we're not perfect. And so, yeah, I can can look at our past and, and I can be critical of the way that we treated the Native Americans. I can look at our past and and I can see slavery was a big issue in our history. And I can see the founding fathers as they wrestled with that issue, trying to trying to come up with with an understanding, a, a resolution. Thomas Jefferson drafted a 168 word argument against slavery, called it the cruelty of slavery and against human nature. And yet that was stricken from the, from the document. Um, John Wesley, one of our founders in, in our movement of the Nazarene church, he wrote his last letter before his death was written to Will, William Wilberforce. And he encouraged him not to grow weary in his efforts to banish slavery in England, in the British colonies. And he even made a, a statement about the, the wickedness of slavery in America. Um, But slavery has always existed in every culture, with every people. And I'm not trying to make an excuse for sin, but pointing out the fact that it's it's existed everywhere and it's not unique to our past and to America. And you can look in South America and Central America and Mexico and Africa and the Middle East and you can see slavery in all of these places of history gone by. But it's the advancement of the Christian gospel that eradicates slavery and eliminates slavery. And it's when we look to our creator who has created us in the image of God, male and female, he's created them, and we are valuable in his sight, and that means everyone, when we operate and live that way, then we, when we stand in opposition to slavery. The other religions don't do that. Islam has always had slaves. India and the Buddhists, they have a caste system, a form of slavery. But it's the abolition movement that comes from Christian nations and Christian people. Marxism and communism grows out of a fight between the classes 
the bourgeois and the, and the proletariat, segregating people into tribes and, and trying to pit them against one another. This, this is politics of envy. This is not of God. And unfortunately, we see this tactic being used today. Right. We, see it, we see it being promoted in our schools, in our universities. And we see the results of Marxism and communism around the world, the mass killings of, of millions. We see the brutality going on in China and places like Hong Kong and how they're clamping down on their freedoms. And we could talk about America's past and we could talk about another great sin of our nation that exists even today. And it's one that Martin Luther King called uh, the genocide of the black race. He said the Negro cannot win his fight for civil rights as long as he's willing to sacrifice the lives of his children for comfort and safety. Planned Parenthood is the largest abortion provider in America. They were founded by Margaret Sanger whose Negro project in the 30s was designed specifically to reduce the number of black births. Today, 78% of Planned Parenthood clinics are in minority communities. Every day, get your head around this, every day, 1,300 black babies are killed in America. 700 Hispanic babies die every day from abortion. Is America righteous? Some want to proclaim America as, as a failed experiment, and I would argue otherwise. America has only failed when we have forgotten God and his ways. So how do we respond? How do we respond in the position that we are in? Do we need a new president? Now, I'm going to preach against any of the godless ways of our leaders, and I will pray for them. But I'm reminded of the words of Chuck Colson. He said, you will not bring the kingdom of God on Air Force One. So a new president is not going to bring in the kingdom of God. And I will not enter the kingdom of God or heaven based on what my ancestors did or didn't do. Ezekiel 18 verse 20 says, The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. And that goes for us as well. Jesus has called us to be salt and light in the world that we live in. And too often we try to saddle up with the ways of the world, maybe with one political party or another. And, and that God needs his people, the church, to proclaim the way of Jesus. Not just when it's convenient, but always. The church in the past has been guilty of ignoring some sins, being blind to our own sins, and then wagging our finger at everyone else and their sins. Of course, that's hypocritical, and that's not pleasing to God. The church has been guilty of trying to grasp for power, and we failed to preach and to live the gospel. God does not need America. America needs God. God has a kingdom, and it's larger than the United States. His kingdom will continue to grow until one day the righteousness of the Lord is going to spread across the earth like the waters cover the seas. And God will be victorious. And I want to be on the winning side. I want to be under God. I want to be with Jesus. And so I want to stand and proclaim, as for me... In my house, we will serve the Lord. And as for me and Hernando Church, we will serve the Lord. And as for America, I pray that we will return to being a nation under God. I pray that, that we will return to following God, no matter the cost. No matter how unpopular it may be. So what are we to do as a people? How do we respond? I jotted down just a couple of things that we can do to respond as our next step. The first one is we need to pray. Chronicles tells us, if my people humble themselves and pray, I will hear their prayers and heal their land. 
So we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our church and our churches across America. We need to pray that we would be a people under God, not just on Sunday morning for an hour, but, but when we walk out of these doors, we continue to live our lives under God. Secondly, we need to give thanks. We've been blessed. We have so many blessings. And, and certainly, being blessed to be here in America is, a, is an incredible blessing that we don't want to take for granted. And so it's good for us to stop like we will this afternoon and celebrate and rejoice and give thanks to God for how he's blessed America and used America. Thirdly, we need to be good citizens. Um, the Bible gives us particular roles for families, responsibilities for families and roles for the church, responsibilities for church, roles for the state, responsibility for the nation. And unfortunately, there's, there's a power play that goes on. And, and in our day, we see the state trying to reach out and, and become the God and, and become the family and become the church. And we've got to resist that. And, and we need to take our roles that we have and the privileges we have and the responsibilities we have as citizens here of the United States serious. And fourthly, I think we need to take the command that Jesus gave us in the Great Commission serious to go and make disciples of the nations. Of the nations. God wants to see America discipled. He wants to see Israel discipled. He wants to see Peru discipled. He wants to see Russia discipled. But God is interested in the nations. He's interested in, in the state of our, of our nation. And so he has given us the responsibility of being salt and light in the world that we live in, to be his people, to call us to be priests to the world that we live in. And I take that responsibility serious. We have a, we have a role to be followers of Jesus Christ, to seek first his kingdom, yes. but also to pray for the healing of our nation. Uh, we're going we're gonna to sing a, a song as we close, but as the musicians come, I'm going to just offer a prayer here for us. Father, we thank you for the blessing that we have of being here as citizens, people living in America. We have a heritage that has so many blessings and so many good things that have been accomplished when we were under you. I pray that, that you would help us to humble ourselves and to come under you again. That we would seek your kingdom first and that we would continue to pray and continue to, to speak and continue to, to stand for the freedom that you have provided through Jesus Christ. God, help us to be a people of God who say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and, and, and our church, Hernando Church in Nazarene, we will serve the Lord. And for me... And the nation of America, we will serve the Lord. This is our prayer. This is our desire. May it be so. In your name we ask.